Welcome to this very special author interaction organized as a part of the NLF Reading Challenge 2021. We are very excited to be here and we hope you are too. The NLF Reading Challenge is a six month long reading event from January to June 2021 for students between 10 to 13 years of age. It is open for participants to take part on the competitive or the non-competitive tracks. We have students from across India participating in the challenge. In addition to fun book-based activities and regular book chats like this one, the challenge will conclude with a quiz competition that will see the three best teams win gold, silver, and bronze engraved trophies respectively, certificates of achievement, and a great set of books. Before we dive into the interaction, we would just like to point out to our audience that as this is a webinar, we will not be able to respond if you raise your virtual hand. Please do type your questions in the Q&A box. In fact, if you already have your questions ready, please feel free to type them out. If you're a student, a teacher, or a school librarian, please do mention the name of your school along with your questions as well. Today, we have with us a very special guest, the Newbery Medal-winning author, Linda Sue Park, whose New York Times best-selling book, A Long Walk to Water, most of us have read. Linda Sue Park is the author of many books for young readers, including the 2002 Newbery Medal winner, A Single Shard. Her most recent book is The One Thing You'd Say, a middle grade novel in verse. Her work includes YA books and picture books as well. When she's not writing, speaking, teaching, or caregiving for her two grandchildren, Linda Sue spends most of her time on equity and inclusion work for We Need Diverse Books and the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. She is also on the advisory board of the Rabbit Hole National Children's Literature Museum Project. Linda Sue has served as a panelist for several awards and grants, including the Kirkus Prize, the National Book Award, the Penn Naylor Grant, and the SCBWI Golden Kite Award. In her travels to promote reading and writing, she has visited more than 30 countries and 49 states. Linda Sue knows very well that she will never be able to read every great book ever written but she keeps trying anyway. Welcome, Linda Sue. We're very happy to have you with us today. Hi, Linda Sue. Could you let us know if you're able to see us, hear us? I can see you, and I hope you can see me now. These are the realities of Zoom that we live with. Hi, it's so nice to see you. Indeed, likewise. It's great to see you too. Um, so uh, I would like to ask for your assistance here. Sure. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be here. And I really appreciate all of you participating in this in, in what is, I know, an, an unusual time. It's, I know it's evening there. Um, it's morning here. Um, and uh, what I would like, um, Karthika, if you could... Um, if you could choose from among the Q&A and ask me the questions, because it's difficult for me to read and talk at the same time. Sure, absolutely. We'll do that for you, no worries. And I know that you also have another Zoom event right after ours. So yes. we'll get started and get right into the Q&A. So I request our members of our audience, if you have your questions, please do use the Q&A box to type them out. Um, and in the meanwhile, we'll pass on the questions that we've already got from the readers, from the mem members of our audience. All right, Linda, so here's the first question. So it's been 11 years since A Long Walk to Water came out. It has sold over 2 million copies worldwide. And the book deals with events which we find hard to imagine, to say the least. But we do realize that it brings us face to face with the realities that thousands of children face every day. One of our readers, Devika, from Parikrama Learning Center, for instance, was particularly struck by what happened with Salva's friend Marielle and his uncle Juir. What has it been like for you as a writer to chronicle all of these events, these accounts, and then revisit them over time, all of these years? Well, that's a very good question. And um, the, um, the questioner asked about two of the very most difficult and saddest parts of the book, right? And um, like most people in, our li in their lives, I've experienced some bad things and some sad things. But I have never experienced anything like Salva's walk, right? So for those parts, I just had to rely on him and my interviews with him and you know him speaking to me. And you'll notice that in those sections, when the terrible things happen, it's not long. 
it's short. Everything happens in a few paragraphs at most, right? And that was, again, sort of echoing a couple of things. First, how it happened to Salva. It happened so quickly, right? It, you know, one, one minute every uncle is there and the next he's gone. And I wanted to reflect that in the story. And also his telling me, these things are sad. And he does talk about them because he wants other people to know his story. But they're still sad many years later for him, right? So he doesn't tell a long drawn out, drawn out story with a lot of descriptive detail and all this kind of stuff. He tells the story quickly and, and sadly, you know, and you can tell he's, you know, I have to tell this story to many people many times, but it's not a happy thing for me. So I tried to reflect that in the writing of the, of the story itself. I tried to make it as much as possible Salva's story. And as a writer, I was trying to sort of get out of the way, you know, just put the words down. Um, English is not Salva's first language. You know, so, you know, he had written part of his story down and he had me look at that and we worked together on it and so forth. So it's sort of, um, I think of it as Salva's story in my words, right? Um, and I tried to make my words um, reflect the feeling that I got from him telling his story as much as I could. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Linda. So, so you know, taking it forward, now you've written this book. Um, you have a lot of readers who are identifying and sympathizing and empathizing with what happens with Salva and Nia. And they go in to actually, to actually engage with the story and do, try and do their bit. Right? So as of 2019, your readers of A Long Walk to Water had raised about $4 million to bring clean water to young people in communities in Sudan. And we're sure that that figure is much higher now. Um, and your picture book, Nia's Long Walk, A Step at a Time, which came out after a long walk to water also speaks about the need for communities to access clean drinking water and the struggles that people across the globe face in something so basic every day. So did you decide to create Nia or the book, the picture book of Nia, but you feel like it's more important for younger readers to access the issue? Yes, definitely. Um, one of the wonderful, um, all of the things you mentioned were just such a wonderful and unexpected surprise for me. I wrote this book because I so admire Salva. You know, I love him. He's a great friend, but he's also this just incredible person to have gone through this tremendous hardship and turned around and turned it into something good for other people and for the, for the world. Right? I'm like, that's amazing. And it is a, an incredible example of one person making a difference, right? So that's why I wrote the book. You know, young people need to know about a dude like this. This is what I was thinking. And then and the readers turned around and said, yeah, but also we want to help. And as you said, they raised money and there are thousands of people all over South Sudan now who have clean water because of kids who have read this book, right? Of, because of kids being powerful. Right, so that amazed me. I never expected that to happen. And what schools did there was they said, we would like to use this book as what's called an all school read. We would like everyone in our school to read this book. And we can do that with about third grade and up. But what do you have for our youngest students? You know, what can, and there are a few other picture books on the topic, which are great also, right? But finally I decided for these schools that would like to do an all school read about Salva that I would write a related picture book. Um, and that, so that idea came much later because it had been years that the book had been out. And actually I think it's up to 4 million copies now. So um, um, after the book had come out and, and schools were using it in this way. So um, that's what, that's how the picture book about Nia came into being. That's lovely. Four million copies. Congratulations on that. Thank you. We have an interesting question that's come in uh, from Mishka Ayoki from Bainu School, Simprug in Jakarta, Indonesia. I know that their teacher had written to us and said that their grade seven students are studying the book as a part of their literature course. Um, Mishka says, it is an honor to have the opportunity to meet with you here today. Our school is a big fan of your book. Um, and it's so inspiring to all of us um, that, you know, we take these things for granted, but, but it's so inspiring to read Salva's account and read Salva's story. Um, and this is Mishka's question for you. Are there qualities about Salva that inspire you in real life, which you didn't have a chance to write about in your book? 
Um, yes, one of the most important things is Selva is a funny, funny guy. He loves a joke. He loves to laugh. He smiles a lot, right? He's always kidding me, right? Um, and that was difficult to get across in a story because the part of his life that I was telling about was not funny. <laughs> and he was not, you know, he was not a big joker back then, right? In what he was going through. So that's really too bad um, um, that I could not get across that aspect of his personality. Um, but he's, he is a very funny guy. Um, you may know um, some from the book that, um, or from, from your research that um, when South Sudan gained its independence as a nation in 2011, Salva decided to move back from the United States to South Sudan. And that is where he lives now, right? So for many years, he lived in the same um, city that I live in, which is in Western New York. And we would hang out, have get lunch together. He'd come to my house for dinner. We had a great time just like friends would. And then he moved away. So now I only get to see him once or twice a year when he returns to the United States. Um, and I really miss him. And what I miss most about him is how he loved to laugh and how he loved a great joke. So, and he teases me a lot, you know. Um, as an example, um, <laughs> he, uh, he once came to dinner just about when the book was finished. And um, of course I had spent months interviewing him, asking him, hundreds of questions so that I could write this book properly. And he said, Linda Sue, I am going to come to dinner at your house and you may not ask me one single question. I was not allowed to ask him a single question. He was so tired of answering questions from me. <laughs> so I'd say, oh, Salva, how's it going? He said, that's a question. <laughs> so yeah, we have, a, we have a good time together. Yes, that sounds like must have been an interesting dinner to be at. <laughs> So, Linda, so I also want to ask you now, apart from the search for water, which is what uh, ties both of these narratives together, right? Both Salva's and Nia's. Um, there's also the idea that, that I thought was very important in both of them, that when the going gets tough, um, you just need to tell yourself that you look for the little milestones, just go a little bit, just go a little further until you can reach a point where you can stop, rest for a bit and then carry on up until the point where you need to get to. And I thought that it could be an interesting metaphor for the times that we live in, where we've battled COVID, um, we're battling issues of race, we're battling issues of class, um, America's battling a new government, maybe not battling a new government, but a change, um, quite a big change. So do you see that your writing, I mean, in you've got the new book, The Middle Grade Novel in Verse that came out, um, you've started an initiative called Kibuka for the Korean Americans and the Korean diaspora, talented writers and artists of children's books from the community. Do you feel like these initiatives, your writing in these initiatives are similar milestones for you personally? Like these are your tangent tree and these are your thorn bush and these are, this is your tree stump where you get to rest for a bit until you have to carry that's on. An amazing, that's an amazing analogy. And I hadn't thought it like that before. I do know that uh, when I put those things in the book, they didn't initially, the one story came from Salva, how uncle helped him. And I was so struck by that, you know, uncle helped him saying, make it to that thorn bush, make it to that rock. I was so struck by that because it is uh, definitely how I find I have to live my life. Okay. I, um, I uh, am, often an anxious person and I can feel very overwhelmed. Okay. I can feel like, and you know, as various phases in my life, when I was a young mother raising my children, when I was working and, and, and had a family and um, my parents taking care of my parents and, and my grandchildren. And there have been, you know, I, I can't hardly remember a time in my life when I wasn't really, really busy, like many people are, and especially like many women are. And um, I would just sometimes feel overwhelmed and I th would think, I just can't do this. I'm just going to stay in my bed all day. Um, and in order to get going, I would say to myself, you just have to do this. You have to do this one little thing. And then you would do that one little. And then all of a sudden that's like, okay, that's not my whole life feeling overwhelmed. That's one thing, I can do that. Then that thing gets accomplished. And I'd say, okay, what's the next little thing? So it's how I get through a day as well as how I get through my life. And it translates to everything. Um, when I'm writing A Long Walk to Water, this is a long story. It's, it's actually not that long, but it ended up being over a hundred pages. 
A hundred pages. How does anybody write a hundred pages? Some of my books are longer than that. They're like 300 pages. That's impossible. I will never get it finished. I quit. No, you can't quit. Today, you're going to write two paragraphs. You can write two paragraphs, and this is important. They can be terrible. This is my assignment for today, to write two terrible paragraphs. Oh, two terrible, I can do that. <laughs> I can write two really bad paragraphs. And they can be really bad because I'm going to rewrite them again and again and again, and that will become another of the small tasks farther down the line. Rewrite those two bad paragraphs. So that's how I get through so much of my life. And so when I heard, when Salva told that story that uncle helped me get through the desert, I, I was like, that's just how I, that's how I live. That's how I think. And, and um, so that became very much a theme of both that book, of Nya's book. And it's in most of the books I write actually, because I'm, I'm pretty obsessed by it. In the recent pandemic, um, I've had, my family has had additional health problems, which has been very difficult for people in the, in the pandemic, because for a while you weren't even allowed to go to the hospital, right? I mean, stay away and this sort of thing. So, um, so these, it just seems super unfair to have health problems on top of the pandemic, but that happened to many, many people, right? And so then I'm thinking just half a day at a time, just get through this half day and get to lunchtime. Okay, you did it, you got through half a day. Let's get through another half a day. So I just find it really useful whenever you're feeling overwhelmed or like life is too much, whether it's your circumstances or a homework assignment, whatever it is that makes you feel like this is too much, I'll never get it done. Take a tiny piece of it and do that. So that's that's what, it, how, what really helps me. And this is um, my friend, Baby Yoda, for those of you who know the Mandalorian, and he has I made him after I made him before I'm, I'm, I'm a knitter and crocheter. So I made him, I made him before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic started, I also made him a mask so he would be very safe. <laughs> so there are, are ways that we've all had of, of helping, help, helping ourselves and helping each other get through this incredible time in history that we're living through. That is lovely. I don't know if we'll get to see too much Baby Yoda in season two of The Mandalorian, but it's a right. good thing that we got to see him here. <laughs> Um, so we have a bunch of questions, um, Linda. So I know that you have about maybe about five minutes, six minutes left before we have to get to your next Zoom call. Yeah, no, I can take a few minutes more than that, but um, okay. I'll try to answer as many as I can. Sure. Awesome. So these questions come to you from a bunch of readers. They come to you from Raina Gupta, Kirat Singh, Noritra Chatterjee, Arushi, Anya Shanoi, who've all asked you about whether Nya is is a true character. And I know that you've written about it and you've talked about how Salva's story is based on Salva's real life experiences. And Nya is a fictional character, but she's rooted in, and she was based and you got inspired to create her when you saw the pictures of the young girls in Sudan uh, who had to carry water, who had to walk for miles a day to carry water to their houses. Um, when your husband took pictures of them in his work as a journalist, they are interested in the idea of why you created twin narratives um, separated by a period of time. I know you've talked about the fact that you wanted to connect Salva's story to Nia's story because you wanted to show two different parts of the story and you also wanted to sort of cover a gap that might come up. Um, but if you'd like to elaborate on that. Right, sure. Okay, so there were actually two parts of Salva's life that I wanted young people to know about. And the first part was his escape from the war and how he became a refugee and ended up in the United States. So that was the first part of the story. The second part of the story didn't occur until 20 years later, him returning to South Sudan with this incredible mission to bring clean water to help the people there, all right? Now, if I had written a novel that just went chronologically through the whole thing, through his whole life, it could have been very interesting, I hope, He's had an interesting life. He's had a kind of typical immigrant's experience here in the United States, both good and bad, right? But the book probably would have been conservatively about 400 pages, okay, if I had done that. And that length means it would have been difficult for teachers to use with students. 
Okay, for this kind of lesson, I wanted a shorter book that many teachers have actually just read the whole book aloud to their students, right? That's really hard to do with a 400 page book. A 100 page book, you can do that, right? Teachers are so busy. They have so many things they have to try to teach you in their year, right? All right, so how do I make it shorter? Okay, I could go and cut out that middle part and just do those two parts. And then I have that gap that you were talking about, all right? How can I tell the story so the gap is not as noticeable, <laughs> all right? And so I took, if you think about the end of, of Salva's story, the second part rather, when he's bringing water to the villagers in South Sudan, that's where Nia's, Nia's story starts, right? She's one of those villagers. So what if I take her story and bring it up to the beginning and take turns with it, and that sort of covers the gap? Right. It also structurally allows me to set up that ending, which is a surprise, not for all readers, but it is a surprise for many of them, the way the two stories come together at the end. And many, many students um, really enjoy that ending of the two stories coming together. Thanks so much for that, Linda. Um, we have a question from Brian Prasod Jo from Indonesia, who says, who asks, how long did you take to write the book? And also from Ria Bopanna, who says, you know, it's so unfair that this thousands of people have to undergo this experience. What can my community and I do to help? Right. Okay, so first of all, the first question, how long did it take? I met Salva in 2003, okay? So I started thinking about, it. I mean, I didn't really start thinking about writing a story, but I started thinking about him and how amazing he was. It was probably 2007 when I began writing the book and it was published in 2010. So right up until before publication, I was revising and editing and trying to make it better. So I would say, uh, honestly, it probably took about four years to write the book altogether. Okay. So that's one answer. And that's, that's, um, average for my, for my novels like this, it would take me about six months write a first draft and then anywhere from one to three years to revise to make it good enough for you guys okay so sometimes people ask me if what I do and I say I'm a writer I should really say I'm a rewriter I do a lot more rewriting than I do writing as far as what you can do as I've already mentioned some young people and or their schools young people with the help of the adults of their adults in their lives have actually raised money for Salva's organization. They've sent as little as a few dollars. They've sent thousands of dollars. They've done whatever they can to help financially to help um, Salva's project. Not everybody can do that. You know, I understand that. Not everybody is in a position to do that. That's why it's great to do as a group because if anybody, everybody only has a few dollars as a group, it's a much bigger pile, right? But the other way, which you are already doing is to spread the word. I read this amazing book about this guy. It's so cool. You have to read this book. You spread the word because you tell a person and they tell a person and they tell a person. And this has truly happened in real life here in the United States. A kid read the book and told someone who told someone who told someone. And eventually down the line, it reached the ears of somebody really, really rich. And they read the book and they gave thousands of dollars to Salva. Right. So spreading the word, telling people about Salva, about the problems of people who don't have clean water, about the problems of the climate crisis in our world. All of that, spreading the word, awareness, educating yourself. That is a tremendous way to help. I'm sure a lot of the people in our audience today are inspired to do something, to do their bit to make a difference. We'll close with this one last sort of combination question, Linda Sue. Um, one from Hitasha Kotari, who says, are there any memories of Korea that influence your work? Um, and another one, which is something that we would like to ask all of our authors that, you know, and especially you, because you've spoken about this on your TED talk, about the importance of reading, about how reading can give you practice at life to handle unfairness with grit and grace, as well as how reading can promote engagement and, and empathy. And you've touched upon, you've given us a list of the books that you've enjoyed reading as a child on your website. Um, and we'll share that out with our participants as well. But could you tell us, um, and in answering Hitash's question about Korea and also about your childhood reading, how has sure. it influenced who you are today? Well, um, my, my parents were born in Korea. 
Okay, and they immigrated to the United States. So I was not born in Korea, I was born in the US. And what I know of Korean culture is from them. And I've also been fortunate to visit Korea several times. But um, one thing that is a part of not just Korea, but many other cultures, um, but my family was definitely in this category is um, the emphasis on hard work. Okay, you, 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 they, they wanted high achievement, but more important than that was hard work. You work really, really, really hard. And um, that means, you know, if your best is not quite good enough, at least you know you did your best, right? So um, that has stayed with me all my life. That's very much a value, that value that many cultures have and many immigrants have when they go to a new country that you have to work really, really hard, right? So that has stayed with me. Now about reading. I was probably in about, I would say fifth grade or so, um, which here in the United States would be 10, 11 years old, right around then. And I was reading a book like this, not a um, graphic novel or a picture book, but a novel like many of you are reading, you know, with pages like this. And I had this sort of lightning bolt realization. When you are reading a book like this, what you are actually seeing in front of your eyes is a white rectangle covered with row after row after row of teeny tiny black squiggles. That's what your eyes see, white rectangle, black squiggles. You are not looking at a screen of people moving around or faces, you're looking at black squiggles. But if you know how to read, a few seconds later, you can be like, <laughs> that's funny. Or you can be, oh, What's gonna happen next? It can be really tense. You can even be sad. Oh, this is, this is really terrible. What happened to Marielle is really terrible. You can be feeling it in your heart, okay? All by looking at black squiggles. Okay, that's like magic. Okay, that was, I sound like, this is like magic. I'm just looking at little squiggles, but I'm feeling emotions. So that's magical, that connection. And if you are a writer, it is also power. I don't know you. You are on the other side of the planet from me. I can make you cry using just black squiggles. That also is like magic. Like I can do that. That's what I do as a writer. I try to get people to feel emotions when I'm not going to be able to be drawing a picture or showing a movie on a screen. They're just gonna be looking at black squiggles. Well, that is something amazing, right? And that realization in my childhood has stayed with me again all my life to think that is the power of words and writing, okay? And reaching people all around the world. You know, if you're lucky, your book's in translation. I'm fortunate that you are all reading my book in English, but it's translated in other languages too, right? So that is something about the incredible power of books and reading and language. And it is so important for all of you young people because today we have access to more information than the world has ever known. You have probably already had more words pass in front of your eyes than your grandparents did in their lifetimes. You are having to process more information than any generation before you and you better get good at it because it is how this world is going to work. There are so many problems in the world, okay? Starting with climate change and racism and religious problems and difficulties and problems with gender. And there are so many problems that we grownups have kind of screwed up and are not doing a very good job at. We are counting on you. You're gonna to have to be the ones to grow up and to save the world. Okay, no pressure, but that's your job. So you're going to have to be as informed as you possibly can to learn critical thinking skills, to think about all these problems and come up with solutions, literally to save the world, to save the planet. We are all counting on you. So keep reading, keep thinking about things, stay curious, be enthusiastic about your learning. And I and all of my adults that I know, everyone, are thanking you for your getting prepared to save the world. Okay, keep reading. Thank you so much, Linda. So that was an absolutely incredible, inspiring talk. 
I'm sure everybody is left with their head buzzing with things to do. We won't keep you up further. I'm sure you have another Zoom call to get to. But thank you so much for taking the time out to do this with us. Thank you okay. also. Thanks so thank much. Thank you. See you. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone, to our audience as well for being a part of this session with us. We have our next author interaction with uh, Paro Anand on April 9th at 5:30 p.m. We are really looking forward to seeing you there. In the meantime, stay safe, take care, happy reading. See you all.